Good morning. It's nice to be with you guys. If you don't know me, my name's Noah. I've lived up here in Toledo going on three years now. I've been helping out with Anchor that whole time. Actually, Pastor Brent was my youth pastor when I was a wee high school troublemaker back in the day. So unfortunately, those grays hair that you see, a lot of those probably came from me and my friends. So, you know, apologies on the forefront for that. But um, I'm filling in today. Pastor Brent is away. He's got the soccer tournament going on. And I, I really think it's cool that he's using that as a tool, you know, to, to meet new people and meet other things. But also, they're undefeated. Come on now, church. There's something. Yeah. There's something about watching, you know, a, a cool thing happen. And, oh, they want another. They want another. And it's just so exciting. So as much as we're going to miss Pastor Brent today, we're praying for the girls. We're praying for the soccer team, praying they win the championship, hopefully, you know, if the Lord wills it. And um, it, like I said, it just really is something cool to me because getting to see, like, his kids grow up over time, like, to where I was the dude in the Kylo Red mask, and they used to just, like, hit me with lightsabers. And now, like, seeing Kara killing it in soccer. And Logan is literally Pablo Picasso Jr., and he can draw anything. And it, it just really excites me. Um, so that's just a little bit about me, who I am. I, I'm excited to share with you guys this morning. I'm really excited for the series that we've been in. Um, we've been going through a series called Positioning Passion. Now, Positioning Passion is something that I think is is cool because in our lives, we have so much, so much that we could be passionate about. We could choose to be passionate about like football teams or we can choose to be passionate about our families. And so in this series, we've been looking at some major areas where Jesus has a passion for something. And we're gonna look and see how we can center our lives around that same passion so that we could live in a way that he is calling us to live. Also, for the Lions fans out there, I promise you, I'll get you out by before 1 o'clock. We'll get you. Well, the Cinderella story will continue. I'll make sure to keep it uh, nice and timely for you guys. So hopefully we can watch uh, uh, good old MCDC's domination continue. Love that guy. <laughs> All right. So like I said, we've been in this series. We're looking at different passions. And we've gone over the passion of stewardship. We've gone over a passion for families. We've talked about having a passion for the lost and, and what does that look like in our life and how are we supposed to, to meet those people. And today, I, I found it a really cool subject uh, as I was meeting with Brent and uh, found out I was going to preach because we're going to be talking about a passion for growth. And to me, that's so interesting because as somebody who's on the younger side at 25, I feel like I'm at a stage in my life where it's just been con like constant growth, whether I want it or not. And it also fascinates me because I think growth is something as a society that we really, really obsess over. Now, there could be many different kinds of this growth. It, it, it could be it, maybe it's going to be something financial. Maybe you're looking for growth at your job. Maybe it's, it's even bigger than that. It's, it's economical growth. It's, it's looking at how we're doing as a country or, or, or population growth. I think these are all things that people can really fascinate over. But even more to ourselves, I think a lot of times growth is something that sometimes we get a little jaded about. And so as we jump into this, we're going to start off as we've done in this series with a psalm, and a, a specifically a psalm that I think talks beautifully about growth. So if you have your Bibles and you're a note taker, get your Bibles out, get the pens or the pencils out. I've got a lot of stuff coming for you guys that I want you to be writing down. I know this series has been huge on that. It's just so many good tidbits that we're getting from Pastor Brent. So if you're a note taker, open your Bibles up to Psalm 92. We're going to be in verses 12 through 14. For once, I was smart and put the sticky note trick. Anybody who doesn't do that, just sticky note. Life changer. <laughs> Alrighty, so if you guys are there with me, starting at verse 12. But the godly will flourish like palm trees, and they will grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God, and even in their old age, they still produce fruit. 
they remain vital and green. Let's pray real quick, church. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today asking um, from this message that we would just have some massive takeaways for growth, Lord, that, that we would be able to, to go through Scripture and see, see how you address it, see how it is addressed throughout Jesus' ministry, and that we'd be able to take a look at that and press in even further. And I pray that all in your heavenly name. Amen. All righty. So like I said, it's, it, it's talking about growth, and, and I think that is something, like I said earlier, we're so fascinated with. And even more nowadays, like, I don't know if any big, like, social media users are in here. I'm like, Brent makes fun of me all the time. I'm the worst. I just, like, mindlessly scroll Instagram constantly. Like, I'm not really looking for anything. It's just more like something to do, I guess. And something I've noticed is this increasing, increasing amount of these, like, self-help people or people who are going to do a podcast on, on how you should grow. And it just really fascinates me because... When I hear that and I see that, it confuses me because I feel like I see less action than ever. I feel like I see all this talk about growth, all this talk about it, and then there's not a lot that's happening in result. And, and even one more specifically, just to go into a little illustration for you guys, I don't know if anybody's heard of a guy named David Goggins. He, he, he's a veteran. He, he, like, works out. He runs super marathons, like, 200 miles, and, and so he does these funny videos, and it's to encourage people, you know, to keep pushing, keep growing as they're working out, and I find them to be, like, the funniest videos of all time. Like, it is the most dramatic, like, zoomed in on his face. He's sweating, and he's just, like, lifting. He's just lifting and yelling the most ridiculous things possible. Who's going to carry the boats? Who's going to carry the logs? And it's funny because when I do need to dig a little bit deeper at work or something, I'll laugh at myself and be like, I'm carrying the boats. I'm carrying the logs. But I think sometimes, unfortunately, as much as I want to keep that energy going, I let life discourage me. I let growth go on the back burner. And I see looking at this psalm, David was someone who never, ever let growth be on the back burner. David was someone that I would say was a lifelong learner. We see as he's penning through the Psalms, his journey, and everything he's been through, and to me, it's truly incredible, because like, it is just like up, down, up, down, up, down, and yet he's still pressing in to growing. He still wants to remain like, like the fruits that are talked about in the Psalms. That even in his older age, he wants to remain vital and green for the Lord. And so that really made me think, church, how often do we look at growth and maybe, like I said, we find those podcasts and we find those certain things and we just think we've arrived. We don't think there's anything left for us to do. There's, there's nothing more to accomplish or, or maybe it's on the other side. I know some people, you might even say that what fruit do I have left to bear? You know, maybe you've been involved in church for a long time and there's been church hurt, or maybe you just feel like you're in a stagnant season. And I think all these things could really, really be squashed if we would go back and press into what Jesus is talking about growth and where he mentions this growth that we see David fully press into throughout his life. So jumping in, we're going to get into scripture again and it's going to be at Luke chapter 18. So we'll be in verses 18 through 30. All right. Now, if you guys have heard this story, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard it. It's a, it's a classic one. I, I always like it, but I'm excited because I feel like going through this, we could see a really different take. So starting off, verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. 
honor your father and your mother? And so the ruler replies to him, all these I kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and go and distribute it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. Now, we're just going to pause right there at the end of that line because if you're like me and you've grown up in church and you've read through scripture, you see those words, come follow me. And for me, like the light bulb goes off right away. Like Jesus is literally almost giving him, he's giving him the disciple proposition at the end of this. He's saying, here's this problem, but come follow me. You, you will be one of us. And I think that's something that sometimes we can glaze over is like, in this moment, just think at, at the size of the call that's already put on this, uh, the young rich ruler's life. But we see it takes a different turn as the story continues. Because when he had heard this, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. And for Jesus seeing that, he became extremely sad. He starts to go on a little bit of a tangent here, and I love it, because this is where, like, if you come to the chosen group and, and you've been around to that, these are the lines that I really like to read, because it adds, like, a, a level of humanity that I, I struggled with seeing in Jesus before. So a little quick plug, if you don't come out, come out to the chosen. It really does, like, help you see these lines in a completely different way. And so then God says, well, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And this is where I, I, really, I really look at that metaphor and I start to see the scale and the size of it. I mean, I don't know if anybody in here sews, but that's a, that's a ridiculous, like, metaphor off the bat. There ain't no camel ever going to fit through the eye of a needle. And so we see the intensity that shifts here. But then we see an even bigger shift at the end of it. And I think it's interesting how the crowd and the disciples react after hearing this. So those who heard it said, well, then who can be saved? But Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. I think so many times we look at that line and maybe we have it hanging up in our kitchens or our living rooms. And I think that it's a great line, but how often are we living knowing that? Knowing the foundational truth just from that line alone that anything is impossible is now going to be possible with him. And so I, I love how Peter responds to this, carrying on in the verse. Peter says to them, see, we have left our homes and we have followed you. And then Jesus replies, and he says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or parents or children who will not receive many times more, many more in this time and in the age to come in eternal life. I love how, that, how massive that is, church. I love it. I, just one more time, he says, if you leave your homes and, and you know the sacrifice, you know the sacrifice it's going to take to get to start growing, you're not going to have to worry about it because God's going to take care of you along the whole entire way. And I just love it because he finishes with that such a level of caring and a loving nature. But right before that, we see Messiah brutal honesty. Where, like I said, he, he goes on a tangent. He's like, this is ridiculous. Like, I feel like there's a sense of he probably had to be, you know, a little almost outraged or something. Because this guy approaches him and he gives him the call and he's not able to do it. And I think when we look at this, we typically look at it on that extremely rich line. We, we get hung up on, this guy had a lot of money. And so he didn't want to give up a lot of money because if I had a lot of money... That would be pretty hard to give up a lot of money. And I mean, thinking that he's, he's the young, rich roller, I mean, so he's got position, he's got influence, and he's probably got like five camels that are the Tesla equivalent. 
It's like the non-spitting models. They, they ride smoother. <laughs> and so I, I just fascinate it because when I was reading through this and diving through it with Brent and just kind of talking through it, I start to initially just or immediately realize that I think what he's really scared of is the journey of growth. Yeah, he had all these riches, and, but he still approached Jesus, I think it's interesting that, that he makes the first step out to him, and yet at the end of it, the call's too big, and he doesn't want to do it. And I think for us, that's where we can really get caught up in life. And I think looking at this and the Psalms, this call is always going to be bigger than a Sunday for us, church. Jesus is always calling us to desire lifelong growth. He wants us to trust his word now and trust his word as we're going through it. And I think just really when we we look at David's life and we look at our own lives, it gets hard to, to see maybe similarities. Maybe there's certain things that aren't going well or, or, or maybe things are going great, but we just don't see the growth that we, we think we deserve. And so that's why I wanted to break down a little bit more. If, you, if you've been around in school, um, you might have heard these two terms. We're going to talk a little, little quick lesson on incremental growth and exponential growth. So incremental growth, that's your usual, I like to think, step by steps. You're taking in life. Maybe you're going to get a new job. Maybe you're going to do this or that. And exponential growth is, I think, that's like the lottery. You're getting massive growth in a short amount of time or even for a long duration of time. And I think that a lot of our lives is incremental growth. Like I said, we're going to be taking steps in one direction. Maybe we're going to take a few steps back in that. And we're going to have to realign. And I think when we even look at last week, as we went through the parable of the talents and looking at the servants, and that third servant, I, he was scared of growth or even lack thereof, because he immediately just went and threw it, threw it in the ground. He didn't trust the bank to grow it. He didn't trust his own will to grow it. And so I think this is, this is a life-altering thing when we begin to press in. Because when we learn to trust God with incremental growth, In our everyday lives, he will always bless us exponentially. There will always be a blessing of exponential growth, church. I promise you. And like I said, as someone young, I feel like it's like a video game cheat code. And it's crazy to me because I went so long without realizing that if I just press in and if I just trust and I don't hold back like the rich young ruler, how much there is for me to step into. And we see him miss out on this so badly because he was too comfortable. He didn't think he needed any more, like I said earlier. He didn't think there was any more in the road for him. He was way too comfortable. And and for me, you know, when I moved up here and, and trying to be like just getting my life together from where I'd been back in like growing up in Youngstown, Ohio, and after the pandemic, and not knowing, do I want to go to school? Do I want to do this? I moved up here, and it was awesome because I entered, like, the most intense growth I could have ever asked for. I was actually learning how to do handy stuff in the renovation process. I, I, I am I'm with Brent all the time, so I'm getting all these cool nuggets of knowledge, whether it be, like, dad knowledge or God knowledge. Like, I just get all these things. And then it was funny because... A time had come where I I thought, you know, I'm really pressing in, I'm growing. And then I had to realize when uh, the day came that Brent came up to me and said, Noah, the parsonage is ready for you to move into it. You no longer can live in our basement. Or no, he always will let me live in the basement. But he was like, oh, this is this is the time, you know, baby birds got to fly. And there was a level of, I had to realize my comfort was gone. You know, like I was up here for two weeks. And, you know, they wanted, I get the guest room snacks. I get the nice stuff. Well, guess what? It was time to go into real life. So that comfort was gone. And, and that's something I, I think is funny when I look at this story is I think, you know, he made the step to go up to Jesus. So we clearly see that he's searching. He wants more. He desires more. But like I said, when, when that big call is asked for him to do it, he's unable to. 
He can't surrender those things. He can't trust. And so we're going to break this down into, I think there's three big things that hold the young, rich roller back. So if you're a note taker, I'm telling this is good. Just one, two, three, boom, quick, and then I, we'll be out of here for the lines. <laughs> All righty. So there's three things, and the first thing I want to talk about today is his pride. I think his pride is one of the hardest parts that he had to deal with, because like I said, he approached him. He had the moment to, to, to almost fall at the feet of Jesus but yet, as soon as he knows how much he's accomplished, how much he's worked hard for, and he's asked to give that up, I think that's when all the voices start coming up in his head. And I know for me, that, that can happen a lot of times in life because it, it, when things are going well, and, and maybe I'm building something more for myself and God's building it for me, it's going to be a lot harder to let go of that pride. It's going to be a, hot, a lot harder to surrender that to him. Because this sinful pride will just eat away at you if you're not able to let him strip back the things of your life. And I think it could be touchy because, like I said, we should be proud. We should, we should be proud of what we do. But there always has to be a level of surrender and a level of knowing that that growth and that accomplishment and even that pride still comes from our Creator. And I like to even think about it in the, in the term of sports. I'm a big Steelers fan. It gets me a lot of crap living up this way just because, obviously, it's Ohio. I can't escape it. But there's a level of pride I have in the Steelers that I could sit up here, and I will admit to you guys, I love the Steelers. They're great. But the sinful side of pride would allow me to stand up here and say, we're going to win the Super Bowl. We're going all the way. That's not the case. That's sinful pride. I have to lay that down at the feet of the Lord and know that Matt Canada isn't going to get us to the Super Bowl. As much as I'd love to think that they're incredible, they're really not that good, and there's always much more improvement that could come for them. And I think this is something that, that we see the young rich roller deal with too. He buys into his own hype way too much. And I think that when we see pride restrict true growth, that's where we need to realign with humility, with the humility of that we see Jesus have. The humility that it takes to, to go from, like I said, his tangent of the needle and to immediately move into, I'm going to bless you if you just trust me, if you just follow me. And so that's our first point today is his pride was one of the things that had held him back. For the second one, and this is always, this is not a fun one, it's pruning. I think pruning was a massive, massive part in the reason why the young rich ruler wasn't able to go through with this. No one likes this process. Like if, 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 if you do any landscaping, gardening, it's, it's not a quick process. Pruning is, is removing the dead limbs, the limbs that, that have no value, but in order for there to be renewed growth afterward. And in this story, in this moment, he's just asking the man right off the rip, you know, what is Lord of your life? What do you need to cut off? You know, in this, it, it was he had money and, and he had riches and that, and that did play a part of it. But he needed to fully prune that out of his life. And I think with this one, like I said, it could be a little bit harder than the pride one because pruning's a painful process. Pruning might mean going back to the drawing board a little bit, maybe looking at some, some things in your life and like I said, just, just knowing that you need to cut it off. I mean, if you've seen a dead or an overgrown tree, or if you've seen the landscaping outside of the parsonage, like when things are dead and dragging, they will hold you back. And that's what Jesus is trying to show the young rich ruler. He is being held back because he's not willing to enter the pruning. He's not willing to enter the pruning required to step into lifelong growth. 
But we can't fear this. We need to remember verses like John 15, 2. We need, to, we need to remember that in the pruning process, we grow back stronger. We grow back better. That even if it is painful, there's a return to it. There's a reason for it. And, and I think if we want to be a lifelong learner, we need to immediately look at Psalms and we need to immediately look at this story and just realize that Entering into that is meaning constant pruning, always. Your life will always have constant pruning. And like I said, it's something hard, something that we could really, really struggle with. But as we press in and as we enter into that alongside pride, it just makes it that much easier to enter in. And then for my third and final point today is it was trust. The third thing that held the young rich ruler back from entering into lifelong growth was he didn't trust that everything would work out okay in the end. He didn't trust that statement that was at the end of Luke, that if I go on this journey, I don't have to worry about it because I will be blessed in return for my sacrifice. And so that's what we talked about earlier. It's just our willingness to surrender to him. It's our willingness to, when things aren't fair, and I, that's something I struggle with massively. I, I am like the, I always want things to be as fair as they can be, and I've learned so harshly, life's never fair. <laughs> and I think if we would just have that attitude of, hey, this isn't fair, this isn't comfortable, but I'm still going to trust. I'm still going to ask. I'm still going to seek. But in the back of my mind, there's always going to be trust. And that is always complete surrender. Because that's what what our faith is. It's trusting in him. And when I think about this this whole concept of growth, and uh, band, if you want to come up, you can. And... Looking at these three points that, that we see the young rich roller struggle with. The, the, the idea of growth, but more specifically the fact that he couldn't lay down the pride. He couldn't lay it down. He wasn't willing to welcome pruning. He was completely against it. And lastly, he wasn't able to walk in trust. He wasn't able to truly understand what blessings were there for him on the other side if he just kept pressing in. I mean, like I said earlier, with with the follow me line, that he was going to be one of the disciples. And yet he lets these three things that I think we could all, we could all change and work on and do good with, he lets them hold him back from ever entering into true growth. And that's something I never, ever, ever, ever want for my life. I never want that. I want to always desire to be growing. I want that if Jesus shows up tomorrow at my front door and he says, I want you to sell off everything you have. I want you to give up your position. I want you to give up your influence and come follow me. I do it because I know the Messiah loves me. I know my growth is always in his hands. And this isn't something I've always known. It's something I've gotten into more recently. It's something I've started walking through more recently and seeing people that inspire me to continue to be a learner like David was. To know that I I wanna be vital in green even at my old age and still producing fruit. And for me, one of those people who had that massive influence on my life was my great grandma Winnie. She was the pillar of my faith. I mean, I would go home, I'd visit her. We'd just talk about God. Like, it was just the most wholesome thing in the world. But do you ever, like, see somebody with a life that just looks so unattainable that that you just couldn't imagine yourself stepping into? Look like an average Joe like me. How can I desire growth in a way like that woman did? 
because she was on her literal deathbed and was doing Bible studies with her church. She was the only one leading them. The younger people would come up to her and they would ask, Winnie, what do we need to do to grow? What do we need to do? And those things we talked about today, those are the things. We need to lay those things down. We need to be willing to prune. We need to be willing to lay down pride and we need to always trust in him. So that's my question for you guys as we get ready to wrap up. Is what is there from those three that that, that you need to look at? That you need to maybe pray about? Maybe it's little things in life. Maybe just understanding lifelong growth. Like for me, it could be, I might need to ask God about what I want from Taco Bell because that just means trusting him more. Then I'm gonna do it. Because I do not want to be like the young man in this story. If, if you leave with one thing today, church, leave with that right there, please. Don't be like the young rich ruler. Desire growth. Welcome growth. Because I want to welcome growth and I want to live like the heart of David. I want to live in a way that when I'm 85 years old, that when I'm about to go, I still have the same burning passion for growth from him that I did when I was saved at Greenford Christian Church at 16. Because that is the only thing that matters is trusting him with our journeys. Because it's never easy, but when we fully surrender growth to him, Just like this verse finishes off, he gives us many more, many more blessings now and even more into eternity, church. So if you'd stand with me, we're going to go ahead, we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right back into the, the Build My Life bridge. Heavenly Father, We just thank you so much, Lord. We thank you that we're able to wake up in the mornings, that we're able to take that breath because of you, because of your son, God. Lord, that we pray that that throughout this message, Lord, that, that, that you would be moving within our hearts, that even after we leave here, Lord, that we would still be burning with that same desire for growth like David did. That even if we're battling giants or we're getting tempted, that we would still be able to look at ourselves and see that same posture of the heart. The same posture that was once anointed king, but still went to the field to grow. So that's my prayer for, for the church today, Lord, is that we'd always be pushing towards growth. That we'd always be willing to go back to you. And I pray that in your heavenly name. Amen.